please judge what I say. A certain man had two sons. The eldest, after much persuasion, received permission to undertake and engage in some perilous activity. And in doing so, the eldest son almost lost his life. And as he returned, he repented of his persistent persuasion against his father's will in order to gain permission. The second son, seeing the activities of his older brother, ventured off to do the same thing. The father then rebuked the son and told him he must not go. The son scorned the reproof and said, My brother has done the same and you gave him permission. The father replied and said, Such was not my perfect will. The young son was angered at the reproof and went and did likewise. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. It says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. It is a habit of children to see a sibling or a friend do such a thing, and then venture to do the same, and to find that it is not allowed to do the same, is angered by it. And says, but they did it, why can't I? This attitude is childish. And we suppose that when we grow up, we just lose childish things. But we actually don't. There is a growing up written here in Corinthians chapter 13, and that's love, the maturity of love, because God is love and God is mature. But the apostle says, when I was a child, I spake as a child and I understood as a child. This understanding of seeing someone do something which is not expedient, not proper, and then my dissatisfaction because I can't do the same. That is childish thinking. It is childish understanding. But the Apostle Paul says, when I became a man, what did he put away? He put away childish things. And I pray that from this message today, we can see if we have put away childish things or not. Whether we have grown up or not whether we have come into the maturity of Christ or not. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Worldliness is child, childish. And God is calling us to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by a maturity of the mind into the full stature of Christ. And when we become mature, then we can prove... And we can know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because it is God that works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. 
there was a man who was translated, his name was Enoch. And before he was translated, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Do we suppose we can be translated without pleasing God? It is God that works in you to will and to do of whose good pleasure? His good pleasure. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 36. Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So after we have done the will of God, when we learn what the will of God is, we aren't to lose that confidence and to turn back. Because if any man turns back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Faith is a growth. It's a continual growth. And when we see activities done in the past, which are immature and we desire, we desire to go back to those things, God has no pleasure in that. There is a class of people who believe you can have more than one wife. You can have multiple wives. And you know what they say? David had them. <laughs> David had them, so can't we? And they don't just say David had them, but read with me in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Second Samuel, chapter 12. And they use scriptures to support their beliefs. And it says, 2 Samuel, chapter 12, and verse 7 and 8. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Jacob. And if and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. It's not that just David had wives. God gave him some wives. So why can't we have some wives? David did it. Why can't I? So this is a childish mentality. They did it. I want to do it too. Is it God's perfect will to have more than one wife? You don't need too much of a brain to work that out, that God only intended for a man to have one wife. That was his perfect will. But David did it, so why can't we? Is David saved? So if I have more than one wife, can I be saved? Why not? He was. Why can't I? This is the mentality of immature, being immature. And we need to grow up. So, well, we, don't, we believe in only having one wife. Does this principle apply to other things? Let's look at Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. Starting in verse 20, here, God is talking to, the, to Israel. 
It says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee, in, bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Pezrites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. In verse 27, I will send my fear before thee and I will destroy all the people of whom thou shalt come and I will make all thy enemies turn their backs unto thee and I will send hornets before thee which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. Here God is saying, if you obey my voice, I'm going to be an enemy to your enemies. You're going to go and I'm going to send in the hornets and I'm going to make them turn their backs on you and they're going to flee and you're going to have their land. Did that happen? No. What happened? Israel took it by warfare. And because Israel took it by warfare, then we say, can we go to war? But they did. They went to war. Why can't we? Did God bless them in war? Was God with them in their war? So can God be with us in our war? But they did it. Why can't I do it? Because look what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 17. It says, But ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Ju Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. There was an example of how God wanted to do it. In Jehoshaphat's army, they sang songs. And as they sang songs, the Lord caused the enemies to be overthrown. Did they fight? No. What about in the battle of Jericho? Did they fight? No, they didn't. And the Lord brought Jericho into their hands. And what about Gideon against the Midianites? Did Gideon have to fight? No. See, God had an intention and that was that his people wouldn't have to fight if they obeyed his voice. But today, we suppose that because they were allowed to fight, we can fight too. And not realizing that the New Testament speaks so clearly that we do not fight against flesh and blood. But some people do fight against flesh and blood. But the New Testament says we don't. Because the true, true Christian will not fight against flesh and blood. The message of John the Baptist, he, he gave a message to the soldiers of the Roman army. And do you know what he said to them? He said, do violence to no man. <laughs> How do you think they would have gone in their Roman army if they weren't allowed to do any violence to any man? But that was the message from the person who was to restore all things. The person who was to prepare the way before Jesus comes. Do no violence, is what he said. And Jesus clearly says, he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. But we say, but they did it. And if they can do it, we can do it too. If you read with me in Ezekiel chapter 20 and understand why it is that God gave statutes to Israel that we should not follow. In Ezekiel chapter 20, Ezekiel 20 and starting in verse Six 
7. Starting in verse 7, we're going to read 7 to 9, and then 24 and 25. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of, his, of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them, in bring in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. So here God told them to do something, and would they do it? No, they persistently rebelled. They said, no, we don't want to do it. They were persistent about it. And God was angry with them, but didn't destroy them because of his namesake. Then it says, Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. So he took them out of Egypt and he took them and he brought them to Mount Sinai. And there was the Decalogue presented, which was the moral behavior of his people. Not to have idols, not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to have lots of wives. All there was the statutes that God intended them to live by. But you notice there in verse 24 of the same chapter, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 24. Notice what the word says. Because they, not, because they had not executed my judgment, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live. See what God did? They really didn't like it so much that they said, Fine, here's some more judgments you can have, but you shouldn't live by them. These aren't good statutes, but have them. And he gave them to, him, uh, to them. And in giving them, he was still with them. Although those statutes weren't his real desire. And we look at some of these statutes that weren't good, that they shouldn't have lived by, and we say, but they did it, can't we do it too? You can read in, his, in the same book of Ezekiel, chapter 14. Ezekiel 14. And this is the principle. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be required of at all by them? Therefore, speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols." that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are estranged from me through their idols. If you have an idol in your heart, you really want it, and you come to the Lord, the Lord will say, fine, you can have that. And I'm going to take them in the idols of their own heart, and they're going to suffer for that. And thus was the case when Israel wanted food and before i read that i read from patriarchs and prophets patriarchs and prophets page 382 paragraph 2 it says god gave the people that which 
was not for their highest good because they persisted in desiring it. God gave it. It wasn't their highest good. It wasn't really something good for them. But they were so persistent that God gave them permission to do it. And if you turn with me to Psalms, Psalm 78, we read the account there of the children of Israel. Psalm 78. In verse 18, starting in verse 18, and it says, And they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. So here the Israelites have come out of Egypt. They're used to the Egyptian food, the meat, the leeks and the onions, and all their ingredients that they had. And their lust, they were craving. They had a craving for it. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as the dust, as feathered fowls like the sand of the sea. And he, and he let it fall in the midst of their camp, around about their habitations. So they did eat and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while the meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Here they were. God gave them their diet, which was angel's food. Would you like to eat angel's food? Really? You know, you wouldn't. You wouldn't like it because it's not McDonald's. It doesn't have meat in it. It doesn't have any dairy in it. And this is the problem. If we say, yeah, we would like it, why didn't they like it then? Are we any different to them? No, God has said we shouldn't eat meat. But the people in the Bible ate meat. They ate meat. Fine, eat meat then. But here... They wanted meat. God said, have it. I'll give it to you like the dust of the ground. Just have it all. And then they died. And we want the same thing. We go, they had it. Can I have it too? If you want to die, yeah, you can have it. This mentality of being immature hasn't left the adult world, hasn't left the, re left the religious world. They look back at the Old Testament and they could do it, they were saved. Why can't we? Do you desire to prove God's perfect will? First king, in, in Samuel, sorry, Israel also asked for a king. Notice the story here in, king, in First Samuel. First Samuel. Chapter 8, starting in verse 4. And all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. 
and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto the voice, howbeit, Yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And he goes through and tells them all the difficulties that they would have. They want a king. God said, give them a king if they want a king, because they've left me. Because it is very easy for humans to look to a Human command to go and do it. And the churches adopt this name called director. The director of such and such ministries or the director of this ministry because they want someone to direct them. Why? Because they have forgotten the Lord. That we have to have a king, some dictatorship, some head, some president. Now there's nothing wrong with someone presiding in a business meeting to make sure the meeting runs well, which is the word president. But there has been a change that there is a kingship authority held in a president or a, or a director or someone of high, of high standing. And we say, well, they had kings then. And you think of David. David was a king of Israel. Was God with him? Absolutely. You know, it was through David in his state of being king that Solomon was born. That Jesus came about. So we can have kings. Can we? It says in Hosea chapter 13. Turn with me to Hosea chapter 13 and verse 9 to 11. O Israel, Hosea chapter 13, 9 to 11. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thy help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? And thy judges of whom thou thou sayest, give me a king and and princes. I gave thee a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Can you hear the attitude of God? You know, you really wanted a king. I gave you a king. And now you've really wrecked yourself. You have destroyed thyself. But I'll help you. I'll be your king if you want. Can't you see that all your kings have utterly failed you? Now will you take me back as your king? I'll be your help. Will you come back to my perfect will? Or will you seek permission to do the wrong thing? If you have an idol in a heart, I'll give you permission. But you'll destroy yourself over it. It's not what God intended. But the attitude that God has, the eldest son of that certain man persisted to do something perilous. He got permission and he almost died. He came back and repented. It was a different story with the younger son. A different story with the younger son. And the younger son showed, Im- showed his immaturity by his wrath or his, his scorn to what the father had said. Because the father had said, I don't want you to do that. I didn't even want him to do it. But he did it. I want to do it too. It's time to repent 
If you read in Acts chapter 17, the messages, the messages of the apostles, in Acts chapter 17, in verse 30, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. They were ignorant. They were like the older son who hadn't, didn't know any better. But then after the youngest son, who can see the effects, goes and does likewise, that is pure stupidity. And this attitude comes from rebellion. It comes from having an idol in your heart. I don't know if you've noticed that when people, when you might uphold a standard, for instance, vegetarianism. Now people say, well, you make that too big, you make it bigger than the gospel itself. But it's a result of the gospel, my friends. And someone upholds vegetarianism and they'll say, but the prophet said, don't make it a test. Don't make it a test. As if that's a license to eat meat. Is it a license to eat meat? No, but it's treated as such. You know, they know the spirit of prophecy statements that create excuses. But they don't read to know what God's perfect will is. All, people are always trying to find loopholes and that is a sign of being immature. That I, wanna, I have something, I want to go to war, so I'm going to study the Bible and find out the reasons why I can go to war. That is immature. That doesn't please God. Because God never intended His people to fight. Never. But yet, because of the idol, he gave them statutes that were not good for them. He gave them judgments that they should not live by. And then we study all the situations of being, of, of, of being worldly and look for all the statements that say, you know, it's good to have a Christmas tree in church and good to have Christmas. So, and that's probably the only statement of Ellen White they really know. Because it's the idol of their heart. That's why they know the statement. But does that change what God's perfect will is in regards to heathen worship? It doesn't change it. If you've got an idol in the heart, you'll find a statement to believe whatever you have. And that's why there are so many churches. Because everyone has their idol. They want to give up some things, but not some precious things. I want lots of wives like some religions have. It's their idol. David did it. Why can't we? Same principle. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 27. God is commanding everywhere. In the time of their ignorance, God winked at it. God gave them permission to do things. But now he commands everywhere, all people to repent. You say, well, Noah drunk. So is it good to drink because Noah did it? But people use that mentality. That mentality shows immaturity. Romans chapter 9. Verse 27. It says, For he will finish the work. And cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah saith before, except the Lord of sorry twenty nine, and as Isaiah saith said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. God is going to finish the word quickly. And if God's going to finish the work quickly, 
then we must be willing to submit to his perfect will, the way God intended that, not to make excuses and to look up and say, well, they let us do that then, or they did that back then. Was it in the beginning? No. Read with me in Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. In verse 3. And here are some religious leaders. And look at the attitude that these people have. It's quite immature, really, except it reflects the attitude of today, unfortunately. The Pharisee also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god hath joined together let no man put asunder They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorce and put her away? But, it, but they did it, so why? See the immaturity? They got to do that, can't we? And Jesus said, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. It wasn't so in the beginning. Yes, they had hard hearts. There's an excuse. There's a, there's a clause for it. Jesus explains that clause. If it's adultery, go and do it. If you've got a hard heart, that's what it was for. And we say, that's a pretty hard saying. Do you know in the youth, courtship is one of the biggest idols that a young person can have. One of the biggest idols. Because marriage was only a shadow of the heavenly. In heaven there is no marriage. And marriage is a blessed thing when it is done in accordance with what heaven was meant for. it. And the reality, the perfect will, never intended that there would be a separation or a remarriage. It was never intended. But there's a loophole. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. And this is what the Pharisees were on about. They came to Jesus. Jesus said, from the beginning it wasn't so. But Moses said this. This is the attitude that the Pharisees had. It's the attitude that prevails today. Always looking to excuse sin by the evidence of someone else doing it in the past. That was saved. And saying, then, then that's okay. And Jesus cleared their question because their question originally was, can a man put away his wife for every cause? That was the question at hand. For every reason. Because that was, if the wife burnt the cooking, can I divorce my wife? Some of them believe that in those days. And there were some people that said, no, you can't do that only for adultery. And that was the question. They came to Jesus and they said, can you, can you divorce your wife for any reason? And he points them right back to Eden saying, it wasn't even, it's not about a reason. Man and, what, and woman were joined together and what God joined together, let no man put asunder. That's what Jesus said. But then he goes and answers their question and says, he says, in and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, shall and marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away, commits adultery. There's the answer. To the Jew, to the Pharisees. You can't divorce your wife for burning the, burning the, the cooking. You can't do it. Sorry. The law of Moses, because it just says uncleanness, and that was interpreted, the, the Pharisees, well, how do we interpret this? 
uncleanness, you know, they could have not washed the dishes properly. That's unclean, isn't it? No, and Jesus says, no, it's what, what Moses was meaning was that uncleanness is adultery or fornication. That's what Moses said. But he wrote it for the hardness of your hearts. From the beginning, it wasn't so. It wasn't God's perfect will. And notice then what he actually says to his disciples. His disciples actually are absolutely astonished at what Jesus had said. Right from the beginning. Wow. They were really astonished. And before we turn to Mark, I just read here. His disciples said unto him, If, if the case of men be so with his wife, it's not good to marry. That's a hard thing. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. This is a hard thing. And it is a hard thing. One of the most difficult biblical teachings for our society to swallow. Very difficult. And Jesus admits it. It's a hard thing. And the only people that can take it on. Other than that, it's, uh, it's just too hard. We look at Matthew, uh, Mark, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And the same account is held. And now Jesus gives a different answer to his disciples. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto him, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation of God, sorry, and from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh so then they are no more twain but one flesh it's one how can you split one and then it says but therefore what therefore god hath joined together let no man put asunder and in the house now, as they finished talking, they came into the house and the disciples asked him again of the same matter. So now the disciples asked the same question that the Pharisees asked. He gave the Pharisees their answer. Because why? Were they tempting him when they were talking? Absolutely. And if we have an idol in our heart, it's there. He said it. Right there for the idol. But here, the disciples asked him again of the same matter, and he said unto them, and he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. That's what he told his disciples. Do you want to be a Pharisee or a disciple? Which explanation do you want? You can have either of them. Depends on your heart. Take your pick. You're free. We're free to take the precepts that we want. But does that mean we'll be saved? Many people in the script in the Old Testament weren't saved. A few were. The older son almost lost his life. Almost. And he repented. And he said, Whoa, we wouldn't have done that if we knew. And now the younger son looks back and sees it all and says, well, they did it, I want to go and do it too. And scorns any rebuke that says you shouldn't do it. This is the mind of an immature person that has not grown up in the Lord. And it is time everywhere for men to repent. God winked at many things. Doesn't mean we can do it. Early writings... Early writings, page 67, it said, Said the angel, angel was speaking to this prophet, 
deny self. You must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. And every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now, time is almost finished. And what we have had years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Time is almost finished. And what people have had years learning by experience, you know, you ask the older people and they've been through the, the mill and you ask them for some counsel. Now, if we want to hasten the process up, do we have to go through the same process, the same mill that they went through to learn their lessons? We don't have time. We don't have time to take on the permission that God has given to hard-hearted people before we learn that that's not what he wanted. We don't have the time for that, my friends. We need to take the experience like the younger person of the family should be able to go through life much easier because he has the parents, the older siblings, to say, hey, we don't do that and we do do that and work it out. Not that way they have to try it themselves, but they can learn from what other people have passed through. People have had years to learn, but we have to learn in a few short months. We have to resign ourselves to say, Lord, your perfect will and that only. Your good pleasure, not your... Not your angry pleasure, not that it's pleasure, actually, that makes sense. But he gave things in his anger. He was upset with them, and so he let them do it. But God works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so Isaiah 58, verse 12, talks about a people. Isaiah 58, and verse 12. Those and they that shall be of thee, those that will be of God, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Do you want to be of God in these last days? Because then, it says in verse 13, If thou turn thy, away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honourable, and shalt honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, and then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of of the Lord hath spoken it. When did the Sabbath begin? In Eden? When did the marriage begin? In Eden? What was the diet in Eden? Did they eat quails? They were vegans. Hmm. The old paths to dwell in. And people say, oh, you're making it bigger than the gospel itself. The gospel brings us back to the principles of Eden. And do you know that until we come back to those principles, Jesus won't come back? Do you know that? Read with me, Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Acts chapter 3. In verse 21. Now, I, I really want to go to heaven. We need to finish the work. God has promised he'll cut it short in righteousness. What people have had years learning, we need to learn in a few short months. We need to say, yes, that's what it says. Let's do it. Forget the idol in your heart. Forget being immature and saying, they did, I want to do it too. Forget it. It says, from whom, sorry, in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive. Talking of Jesus. Whom 
the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Jesus went to heaven and the heavens received him until restitution, the restorers of the path of dwelling, has been built up. And if the old people won't do it, the young people have to do it. And we can't make excuses and say, I want to do what they did. I'm missing out on things. We're not missing out on anything, my friends. We're not. We can see the history of the events. We can see the misery that came of it. You see the misery of having more than one wife in the life of Jacob? Wrecked his life. And we think that it's a good idea? Sorry. There needs to be the time of restitution of all things. It is prophesied by the holy prophets that it would be. We read it in Isaiah. And so I'd just like to conclude our message with a text of encouragement because we have done things wrong. We have gone down the road of permission that wasn't his perfect will. And we have, many of us, have wrecked our lives over it. You might be at the end of your life and you think, boy, I wish I started again. I wish I had my time over again. There's a Bible text for you, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Because although we destroy ourselves, God will be our helper. You remember the attitude. You've had a king, you've wrecked yourself, but can now I be your king? You know, you might have had a bad marriage. God, can I be your husband? Can I be your soulmate? Can I give you the real thing that marriage was only a symbol of? Read with me Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. But and if from hence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek with him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice, the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. Now, if you find yourself in trouble, if you have gone down the wrong road, God is standing there. And he says, I will help you. I'm not going to destroy you if you will turn back to me. Turn back to the Lord and give him everything. Say, Lord, I want your perfect will. I want exactly what you want for me. And God is a merciful God. It's not too late, my friends. It's not too late. Ephesians chapter 4 gives the purpose of God's church. This is the holy purpose of His church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. To 14. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What for? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. My friends, don't be deceived 
by the church is saying it's okay to do this and do that, which is not God's perfect rule, because they bring up biblical accounts of such things happening. Don't be children anymore. Don't say, I want to do it because they did it. God's church has one holy purpose, and that is to edify, to educate, to build up the people unto a perfect man, to the maturity of Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ desire the perfect will of God or not? He says, not my will, but thine be done. And I pray that we can be determined to pursue his perfect will. It needs a conversion, otherwise we can't see it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is God's good and acceptable and perfect will. I have decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back, my friends. Amen.